You have entered Roguelike Radio. Hello and welcome to Roguelike Radio, the procedurally generated podcast where all of the participants eventually die. In this episode, we are talking about Dungeon Hacks, a book about roguelikes by David Craddock, and David is here on the show. Hello, David. Hey, Darren. How are you? I'm good. And we've also got Mark Johnson of Ultima Ratio Regan with us. Hello, Mark. Hello, everyone. For those that don't know, Dungeon Hacks is a new book being released this year about the history of the roguelike genre, and not just roguelikes, but also the early days of Rogue when we had BAM and other games similar to Rogue. David, how long have you been working on this book? It started, I would say the research process started back in 2009 informally. I began researching and writing a book called Stay While and Listen about, of course, Blizzard and Diablo. And I was familiar with roguelikes before working on that book, but obviously got really deep into them, especially talking with guys like Dave Brevik, who was inspired to make Diablo by, uh, as he put it, kind of wasting away his college years playing roguelike, but we know that's not really a waste of time at all. Uh, And then I started playing them, looking into them, and at first I was going to add a little extra chapter about Moria and Angband and NetHack, since those are the games specifically that influenced him. But the more I looked at the history, the more the genre fascinated me, and so I decided to spin it off into its own book. It's In a way, it's almost a spiritual prequel of sorts to anyone interested in Stay A While Listen and Diablo. But of course, it stands on its own. Yeah, it very much stands on its own. It, it goes right back to the beginning of what inspired the people behind the original Rogue and other games of the time. Uh, how did you get started then when it came to doing the research and putting ideas together for how to put the book together? Sure. The process for starting Dungeon Hacks was nearly identical to starting Stay While and Listen, which was to just start Googling the names of games, look up the people who made them. That information, of course, as you all know, is readily available on Wikipedia. And then from there, I just went to, I went to LinkedIn, I went to Facebook, various forums, and basically sent out feelers saying, hey, this is who I am. I write books about games and I'd like to talk to you. And uh, most people took one of two routes to get me information. They either answered questions over email, which is always nice for authors because it makes our job a lot easier. We just take those emails, we proofread their answers, do follow-ups, and then just kind of copy and paste their quotes in, plugging things in in the book and the narrative where we where we want them and where they go. And uh, Or I would talk to someone over Skype and and do the whole transcribing, proofreading, marking up, and just assemble a book from interviews, either the ones conducted over email or Skype, and woven around my research from second and third-hand sources. Just for those that don't know much about the book, this is a a full-size novel talking through the history of the roguelike genre, starting with Beneath Apple Manor, then going on to two chapters about Rogue and interviewing the creators and the, the whole history of Rogue, not just how it got made, but how it got distributed, how it got built, how it got taken up by epics and so on. And then it goes on uh, another chapter on Sword of Fargo, a chapter on Hack, a chapter on NetHack, then Moria, then Angband, then Adom, and then uh, a whole load of extra content about different roguelike projects and about the seven-day roguelike process. So it's a very, uh, very in-depth book, goes into a lot of detail of the history, and the, the what we would now call the early history of roguelikes, because it goes up to Adom, which was sort of the 90s. And I must say, I was very impressed by the book. It's full of information I wasn't aware of. There's a few things I knew in there, but there's a lot of new stuff and a lot of really interesting stuff. And from a sort of perspective of of someone who does a lot of writing myself, I was very impressed by the writing of it, actually, David. It was, uh, most of these sorts of books can be a bit dry or perhaps... (laughs) Or perhaps be a bit too light and sort of not uh, formal enough in their text. But you've got the kind of the nice balance of flowing, well-written text that that goes into depth without coming off as being too academic. I appreciate that. The first chapter starts with a section entitled Environmental Conditions that talks about convergent evolution. And I swear that's not the introduction to a textbook. I didn't want to scare anyone, <laughs> anyone away. But, you know, the whole point was what really fascinated me about the role like genre and continues to fascinate me is not so much the individual games, but how all of these these people like Michael Toy, Glenn Wickman, Don Worth, who come from these, they're, they're in completely different places, but they were inspired by a lot of the same things, such as Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Lord of the Rings. And even though they were in different environments, they were influenced by the same sort of factors and kind of arrived at the same conclusion. And I just find that 
aspect of roguelike culture fascinating. So I wanted to endeavor to tell a story. I didn't want to write something that was, you know, as you say, dry, sort of like a textbook. It's it's really the format I use is is known as creative nonfiction, where it's a true story, but it reads sort of like a novel. So I appreciate that you enjoyed it. Mike, uh, I presume you've read the book as well. I have indeed. Um, one thing which really uh, struck me, kind of linked to um, the thing you just said, is that um, although clearly these were people in very different um, situations in a lot of ways, that there was a kind of broad similarity in terms of their uh, university backgrounds for a lot of the devs at very high-ranking places like uh, Berkeley and uh, and uh, UCSC and Stanford and MIT and so on. And whilst clearly on one level it makes sense in the sense of this was an era where you probably wouldn't find PCs outside PC labs on campus most of the um, time, but right. it really kind of struck me um, how strongly the classics of the genre emerged from these sort of very similar-ish sort of CS plus physics plus engineering uh, campus-based environments. Right, and that was something else that I wanted to explore, and really what led to my interest in chronicling Darren and several other individuals who partook in the the seven-day roguelike in 2013. I chose that year just because that happened to be when I reached the stopping point in the book and could kind of look for other material to work in. I found it interesting that, unlike in so many other game genres, for example, first-person shooters in Call of Duty, which is which is so ubiquitous in mainstream gaming now. You have a lot of players who love to play Call of Duty, but they often don't take that extra step and try to get their foot in the door in the games industry. They don't go on and make games. It's just sort of a hobby for them. But anyone who was interested in, in computers and computer games when roguelikes originated were, were very technical people who wanted to do more than play games. They also wanted to make them. And I found that, in a way roguelikes are almost the the Olympic torch of gaming where you have the torch passed on and on and on through different stewards who do more than just play these games. They want to leave a footprint in the genre as well. I think in one of the chapters you mentioned that in some ways some of the early kind of dev teams were a kind of proto open source movement almost. Correct, yes. I found that interesting as well. Originally, I took it a bit too far in the subtitle. I think the subtitle originally was something like how roguelikes revolutionized video games and changed the course of software development. And that, of course, is sort of a first draft subtitle where you're very excited and pleased with yourself that you've made this thing. And then you dial it back a bit and realize, sure, roguelikes didn't create the open source movement, but you could certainly argue that they were on uh, the front or maybe uh, second to front lines in really the game space, just encouraging other people to kind of pick up where their forebearers left off and continue building on a foundation. So you talked earlier about convergent evolution, and I think you show quite dramatically in the book that there was these three early games, uh, Beneath Apple Manor, Rogue, and Sword of Fargo, which all independently of each other came up with remarkably similar games with the procedural dungeons, the permadeath and the same sort of Dungeon Dragons-esque mechanics. What's your thoughts behind why they all ended up so similar to each other? I think Dungeons and Dragons all played a big part in that. You know, traditionally in D&D when your character dies, that's it. And I think that's a very important element of helping players establish connections to their characters. Especially, uh, you know, if you play games these days, a lot of them are so soft. Uh, not necessarily bad games, but there's really no sense of risk or reward and therefore no motivation to connect with your character. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Prince of Persia series. I've played it since, not since the Apple II version, but since the Macintosh version. And even though I enjoyed the 2008 reboot, I guess it was, I often approached the game lackadaisically without giving any thought to what I was doing because there was no way to die. If you fell into a pit, your AI companion just kind of hauled you back out. So it encouraged exploration, but growing up playing games on on DOS and on the NES, I was used to putting a, a lot more stock into my characters' very finite lives. And I think that also influenced roguelikes as well, uh, specifically with permadeath and Dungeons and Dragons. If you can really feel like this is real, like you're actually in this dungeon 
approaching this this pack of ogres or trolls or dungeons or what have you, even though you're just looking at a black screen with a bunch of little alphabet characters running around, you are immersed in this world. In fact, the original idea I had for the cover was an image that was uh, half ASCII text and half actually illustrated pictures because I wanted to kind of show that that's what happens when you play these games. It starts out as just text, but the deeper you go, the more you are pulled into this world. There was a bit, I think it was in the Moria chapter, I think, where one of the devs of that uh, said that they kind of had all these types of uh, feelings which they kind of wanted to um, elicit from those who would then play it. Like uh, fear and truly caring about their character and being concerned about what's around the next uh, corner and so on. And I thought that was kind of quite intriguing in that clearly in general to the kind of average non roguelike player at least one wouldn't really think of ASCII games as being kind of scary or being compelling or being dramatic in some way but that he really kind of wanted to um, induce these types of feelings in his uh, players. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. And I think that roguelikes are so powerful because they rely on imagination. What was it? The um, Now I can't think of it. The developer who made Zork, they ran an ad in magazines that said, you know, something akin to, our games run on the most powerful graphics processor ever created, your imagination. And I think that really is evocative <laughs> of, of roguelike yeah. games because, you know, that's what they're they're all about. And uh, kind of a, a step or two sideways, if you look at indie games these days, indie games are really capitalizing on imagination as well because so many of them are rooted in 8 or 16-bit art styles where the graphics are quite explicitly said to be secondary to the gameplay and how the game systems interconnect and how those interconnected game systems create new and exciting experiences every time you play, which is really, that's how I grew up. I've replayed a lot of games. My family was by no means poor, but my parents more tolerated my video game <laughs> habit, which grew into an obsession rather than encourage it. So I only got two or three new games a year. So I really got into games that offer replay value. To me, if a game is, you know, I guess the buzzword these days is cinematic, a game like Uncharted, which is a fine game, but it's really only worth playing once, and that does nothing for me because I want to go back to games and treat them like sandboxes with different toys every time. The possibility for different experiences, new experiences, is what really intrigues me, and with roguelikes, that's really the name of the game. Yeah, I guess as well as this sort of imagine what you think foes and places and um, weapons and so on look like. Also, um, this was in the Moria chapter, I think, where um, they found that people playing the game would kind of ascribe logics to the monsters which weren't in <laughs> fact there, and it was just a coin flip or, or a uh, die roll or something. But they say, no, 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 he, uh, he trailed me here, he followed me here, he did this, there, he uh, flanked me and so on. Right. Uh, the creator of Moria experienced that. I know that in the process of making Rogue, that was something that Michael Toy and, and Glenn Wickman and Ken Arnold also encountered. The fact that really, you know, as kind of the, the forebears of the roguelike genre, they didn't really have as much experience as maybe we do today, being able to look back at their works and seeing where we could improve to create these complicated AI algorithms. So you know, as Michael Toy said, he kind of lamented the fact that most of his more advanced monsters were just, they were bigger, they hit harder, and they yeah, had, had more, more HP. Health, yeah. Right, right. But as, as you play, you, you kind of observe these patterns, and because you're so immersed in the world, because you are in that moment, you start ascribing, as you said, uh, patterns and thought uh, where there is none, and that's very intriguing to me. It's kind of like something I've um, seen a little bit in my own work, which is that sometimes that players will think a certain piece is more complex PCG than it truly is, or, <laughs> or that it's less um, complex, or that they'll think that a handmade piece of uh, content is a PCG and vice versa. And so I think there's some kind of intriguing space, which um, this part of the book spoke extremely well to, I think, that what players perceive is what truly kind of matters, I guess, rather than what are the exact systems which are making this type of um, experience. Right. And, you know, you brought up an interesting point earlier where you said that when you step into a dungeon, every player who steps into a dungeon kind of sees it in a different way, which is why I prefer roguelikes that are very uh, vague and sort of basic in their descriptions. You know, saying you step into a dungeon is great because 
I might imagine gray stone walls and moldy tombs, but you might imagine something where nature has crept back in. And you can't say, well, that's wrong, because there is no explicit definition to the dungeon. All you really see are corridors and doors and rooms. You can ascribe any other characteristics to them that you want. And of course, that's not, that's something, this is a subject I tackled, hopefully adequately in the epilogue, which is, you know, in modern games, any games with graphics, really, not just modern ones, if you want to show something, you have to have the art resources and the time and the budget to create it. But with roguelikes, you just kind of fill in the gaps. In a lot of ways, roguelike is the natural uh, evolutionary step to, I would say, interactive fiction, because interactive fiction, and this is a problem that, that Michael Toy encountered and something that prompted him to create Rogue, was once you solve the story, once you solve the puzzles, the story and the puzzles don't change. But roguelike is essentially you telling a story without lots of text. Yeah, telling the story through through the action. Correct. Uh, and the narrative coming about through how you play. And we see the same thing coming about through Dwarf Fortress these days, where people build these narratives out of how their fortresses evolved and what the various actions of the different characters were. And that, that weaves a more interesting story for them than maybe something that is put upon them in the likes of Uncharted. Yeah, you know, I think that human beings naturally gravitate towards stories and we have so many ways to tell stories and the funny thing is a lot of people say story doesn't matter in games and yet when a game is reviewed and you get the all impressive all important score from an outlet like IGN or you know like the, these days you know Joe Schmo on YouTube I guess uh, the first thing they criticize if a game didn't meet expectations is the story and yet in most cases when they when we say story we are referring to a traditional narrative with a beginning middle and end but roguelike the fact that you don't have to sit there and read lots of text, the fact that all of the storytelling is happening through action just makes them so not only endlessly replayable, but so endlessly interesting. It would almost be, if I had the time, maybe one of you can, can take up this torch, but it would almost be interesting to write stories of your roguelike adventures, create a novel out of it, and just go step by step to what you were doing in the game, because I think that the, the genre uh, lends itself to that pretty well. I would actually suggest that that would be an incredibly boring story. <laughs> don't I hit the not, orc, hit the orc died. I hit right. the cobalt, the cobalt died. The, I mean, one of the things is like, games generally don't make good stories, and a lot of games which have kind of forced upon stories, like Uncharted or whatever, they don't hold up very well to those narratives because you've got this guy who's supposed to be maybe sympathetic in some way and he's supposed to have weaknesses and so on and then he, he plows through 20 people and doesn't care about murdering them all and giving little quippy one-liners while he's doing it. This is something it. extremely like Tomb Raider 1, um, the um, new Tomb Raider I mean, where it's all about Lara's growth and her mm. being developed as a character but then she just stabs a thousand people in the spine yeah. and murders and murders the entire population of an island and you think well can you really develop all that much from that aside from <laughs> becoming a complete sociopath yeah i mean yeah, so, yeah. some games actually play upon that like spec ops the line yeah yeah deliberately plays on that and those are the most clever but most games due to the very nature of having repetitive conflict of some description repetitive challenges ultimately don't make good stories. You would have to condense them massively to get an interesting story out of it. Yeah, I think games produce a different sort of narrative than something like uh, reading a book. In, in reading a book, you don't need the constant conflict. You want more sort of slow growth and kind of curves to the story, as opposed to this like, very constant engagement with a game. I think right. things like a uh, Boat Murdered in yeah. um, DF and also having just googled it, um, Kakame Awi Medinade, um, I think is, is um, this tale of an uh, elf king of the dwarves who someone had in their game and went on this sort of amazing quest and there's all this uh, fan art and these kind of fan stories about him and so on. And I think those examples are clearly extremely rare compared to the tens of thousands of people who experience Dwarf Fortress each uh, day, clearly, but the fact that there are some really, really stand-out stories does does seem to be something which kind of lends itself slightly more to uh, roguelikes, and maybe to an extent things like um, YASD and YAVP posts are kind of a lesser version of that, where you kind of try to tell a tale of why did your player die, or why did your player um, ascend. Sure. And I, I think there is some extrapolation involved. You know, while we were talking, I was thinking of Jeff McCord, who created sort of Fargo. What he did was he had a Dungeons and Dragons campaign 
with his friends, and he just kind of converted that into a roguelike story. But then sometimes the opposite is true. I think it was um, maybe Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman who created their their successful, hugely profitable line of Dragonlance novels by taking their D and D characters in campaigns and kind of you know adding in a little bit of story in between all of the hitting the skeletons and looting tombs and so forth. Yeah, there's definitely kind of adaptability between those sorts of things. And Dungeons and Dragons especially, I think, is perhaps a step between a video game and a novel in terms of the amount of actual story that that is there and that you can kind of feel engaged in. Right, right. Going back to the book... I mean, I must say, I was incredibly impressed by the, the vast range of people that you contacted, and not just the developers, but sometimes the developer's teacher and <laughs> people that worked with the developer and, and all these kind of other opinion pieces and reflections and, and sort of going back into their social lives and stuff. How did you find it, kind of digging out all these different contacts and getting in touch with them and getting getting information from them? You know, I created my own publishing company for these video game history books. My wife and I co-founded it and I came up with the name Digital Monument Press. Digital because originally we were only going to sell ebooks and, and Dungeon Hacks will be our first book that will be available in paperback and also as an audiobook, which of course is another form of digital. But the monument part came about because what I wanted to do was I wanted each book to really feel like a monument to its subject matter. I want reading Stay a While and Listen and Dungeon Hacks and the other books I have uh, kind of waiting in the wings to feel like you're walking into this wing of a museum and it's not dry and dusty. You have all sorts of of interesting, exciting, hands-on exhibits that give you as many perspectives as possible. And it was necessary for me to track down those perspectives, even even the most minor ones. You know, so-and-so saying, well, my teacher suggested that to me was a thread that I needed to follow because perspectives color stories. Uh, And not only do they lend more detail and information, but sometimes contacting someone like uh, Brian Harvey, the the teacher of of Jay Fenlison, who uh, created Hack, he gave me so much information on his class and the culture that he established. In fact, of all the chapters I wrote, I'm very proud of Dungeon Hacks. I say that humbly, but my favorite is chapter five, which deals with Hack because the sort of egalitarian hands-on culture that Brian Harvey cultivated for his class, which was where Hack was born, was something that I experienced firsthand. When I was in high school, I had a programming teacher named Bill Carley, who, this guy was wonderful. He made himself available in between classes and after hours to help the kids with the programming classes. When we got our work done, he let us hang out and play games. It almost felt like being in college. I mean, normally in high school, you're there bell to bell and then you go home and it's in college where you seek teachers out during their office hours and uh, in your spare time to get more help. But I just, I, I learned a lot there. We learned basic Pascal, uh, C++, and it wasn't reading from a book that interested me in learning more about these languages and about computer science in general, it was the fact that I was just, I was given carte blanche. I was allowed to go learn what I wanted to learn. And and that sort of, that, that culture, that environment was pervasive, has been pr- pervasive throughout roguelike history. And I think uh, really makes for an interesting part of the story. It's quite interesting to hear that because I would have, I'd say that was my favorite chapter as well. And partly because you felt the real passion of the teacher coming through the page and obviously that's partly due to yourself having a great respect for that passion and for the ideals that he was pushing forward. Thank you. So did you have trouble tracking any particular people down or was it any particularly hard to get people? The hack and net hack crews were both very tough to reach. You know, so often in roguelikes you'll have someone who created a pioneering game but has not done much in games since, either because they just lost interest in games or because their pursuit of, you know, working in the industry didn't work out. Obviously, Michael Toy was very active on on Live for a while. Glenn Wickman is still at Zynga. But a lot of the hack crew, these games back in the the, the 70s and the 80s, there, there really wasn't a games industry. People just kind of made games as as hobbyist activities and then went on about their lives. Very few saw creating a game, writing a game is sort of a gateway into a career. And I mean, a lot of the hack guys were just off the grid, which is almost ironic considering their deep technical backgrounds. I really had to dig up. And when Facebook and LinkedIn failed, I would rely on current contacts. Brian Harvey has a very prolific presence online. And after talking with him, 
we got a rapport going and I said, Brian, would you help me track down anyone else you can get a hold of? And so he pointed me to Jay, he pointed me to Mike Tomey, and really it was just kind of building this Rolodex, starting at social media and just kind of working my way deeper and deeper to people as I got to know more of them. It sounds like a sort of dungeon adventure in itself. It was, and I feel like a lot of it was procedurally generated because sometimes <laughs> I had no idea where information was going to come from. And then it just, it, in fact, uh, I didn't, I talked to Jay Fenlison after the hack chapter was written. So that involved going back, you know, putting the chapter under the knife and, and reworking parts of it to have Jay's perspective in there. And he was such a humble guy. I didn't have to, to rework much of it because even though, for example, Brian and Mike, uh, with whom I spoke, they were insistent on giving Jay all the credit. Jay turned that right back around. He said, no, no, I, I really appreciate their input. I took input from anyone willing to give it. And so it, it's that that is another indication of, of how much I enjoy writing about really any game development, any genre, any scene from the, the 19, late 1970s through the early 2000s, before games became this multi-billion dollar behemoth, no one really wanted credit. No one really wanted to fight to make sure their name was on the proverbial box. Everyone was just so excited about collaborating and creating. And uh, I'm really glad that you all felt the, the passion in my words, because I was just really excited to convey that, not only in Chapter 5, but throughout the whole book. That's why I took the opportunity I gave my editor fits occasionally because I would play with the formatting uh, in chapter seven, which I believe is the Moria chapter. Rather than section headers, I just kind of worked in little passages from Fellowship of the Ring about Moria because I wanted to set the atmosphere. And uh, so it was just kind of a fun story to really play with. And uh, I'm glad it turned out well. And then you did this extra thing on top of the kind of the history of uh, interviewing various seven day roguelike challenge participants. Mm -hmm. and you, you spoke to people before they started the seven day challenge and then on each day you had a little interview with, with most of them and kind of wrote their thoughts as that was going on I was a victim of this <laughs> uh, I volunteered when you put out the call and this was the year I made Mosaic and I must say it was very amusing reading my thoughts like looking back <laughs> and saying did I really think it was that good <laughs> um, as I recall you were quite sleep deprived and riding high on the excitement of finishing yeah yeah I, I didn't sleep for two days straight at the end of that <laughs> um, but yeah it's it's kind of amusing because the seven day row like challenge week actually does get quite emotional like it feels like a very pressured kind of environment and you Mm -hmm. you're, you're desperate to get something and you're really happy with any success and really crushed by any failure or frustrated by any obstacle and yeah I can, I can really see my emotions in that text and it brought me back to when I was doing that back then how did you find that whole experience of interviewing these different people and getting getting all their little stories if they're all individual week long stories that have developed over this time that was an absolute blast I really enjoyed getting to talk to to you because well, you and also I got to talk to people across the spectrum, which is really what I wanted. I wanted to talk to someone like you who's very experienced, uh, sort of a pillar in the roguelike community, and also someone, uh, sons of people like uh, like Bastian Gorison, uh, Yuji Kasuji, and I apologize if I'm butchering any names. Uh, this is one of those cases where I very rarely have had to say the names out loud. I've just been typing them for years now. <laughs> um, and, you know, these folks like that who were throwing into the 7DRL for the first time, what happened with that was it was originally going to be a bonus round, which is my cute little uh, subtitle for just an extra uh, appendix in a book uh, that's video game themed. Um, but what happened was the the journal got so large it was it's well over 150 pages I think because I've I've since gone back and input uh, entered everyone's screenshots and so forth that they sent me that my editor said you know this is it's very different in tone it's huge I think you're doing a disservice to these people by kind of tucking it away into a bonus round and that was an eye opener for me because I certainly didn't want to give the impression that I was you know burying it at the bottom of the book so to speak so I spun that off it's now uh, it'll be a separate ebook called One Week Dungeons Diaries of a Seven Day Roguelike Challenge. And I, I really hope that my interest in the subject matter, if I may refer to you all, my guinea pigs as such, uh, because you all had. I'm totally comfortable with that. <laughs> well, everyone had such, such interesting stories, and that's really wanted. I wanted to convey, I wanted to write these entries as if they were journal entries, kind of written in the third person. Again, I'm very big on creative nonfiction. I don't want to write anything dry. I want to tell interesting stories. And I thought it was really interesting following people day by day, especially when, not to encourage any shot and fraud, but 
it was always interesting when people started to slip slide because that's the drama, right? The, the drama isn't creating the game. The drama is will they be able to finish this game into which they have so so overtly invested hopes and dreams. And uh, I think it makes for a really interesting read. There was one particular one where you kept saying each chapter. I, I'm not sure if he's going like, to... He sounds like he's making progress, but I'm not sure if he's going <laughs> to do this thing that he really wants to do. And at the end, well, he didn't get to do that thing he really wanted to do, but... <laughs> But yes, uh, and I think I even went and revised that because I definitely didn't want to inject too many of my own thoughts. I don't remember if I fixed that or not, but it was interesting because I've since written an epilogue, Darren, I don't know if you got that version, but really, you know, my point was, much like roguelikes themselves, you often learn about creating games and about succeeding in game jams, such as the 7DRL, by failing. Failing isn't always a bad. It's not like you're getting a term paperback with a big fat red F. It's, well, what did I learn and how can I carry that over into my next adventure? And and that's really one I wanted to convey. I mean, the fact that that particular person turned his game in at all is is uh, makes it a roaring success, in my opinion, because how many people can say they've sitting down and written a book or, or, or developed a game or made something, you know? I actually quite appreciate your thoughts. I thought it was interesting seeing reflections on each thing. You're seeing what they're saying. You're seeing kind of the the author's voice as well, and it made for the feeling of tension as it progressed across the chapters. Well, that's good. I'm I'm glad because I this is a book I'm very unsure of. I'm I'm also very proud of One Week Dungeons. I found it interesting, but it's one of those deals where maybe it's just because I'm too close to it. But I'm never sure how people are going to to like something that I've written. And I think I think One Week Dungeons makes for as interesting a story as as roguelike uh or roguelike uh dungeon hacks or stay a while and listen. But you know you just never know. And and I think the book is very palatable because. Since it was designed from the ground up to be an ebook, I was able to play around with the formatting. For example, if people want to focus on your story in particular, Darren, they can they can start with you and then follow a link at the end of your chapter to go right through your journey, and then when you reach the end of it, to go back and follow someone else. And uh, so I, you know, I think that'll be interesting. You can either follow everyone at once, or you can kind of zero in on someone and see how their specific story ends. It reminded me actually reading it through, and and I read it through, and the kind of reading everyone's all of the day zero things and all the day one things. Remind me a little bit of Fellowship in the Rings where it keeps just cutting between different people and then you see a bit of their journey and you're like, oh, but what's going on with the others? And then you cut back to them and you're like, oh, but what's going on with them? <laughs> nice, nice sort of adding to the kind of wondering what's going to happen next. Yeah, and it's interesting. What I ended up having to do, and I really had to think long and hard about this, was I ended up a spreading kind of the day zero conversations around into other chapters. What ended up happening was there were there were several days um, for several participants who, when I would call them, I think day three was probably the most infamous, where they said, oh, I didn't have time to work, or work was really busy, so I only coded for like 30 seconds. And those chapters were very short. I was okay with that, but my editor said, look, if I, if I turn to this next chapter and it's like two paragraphs, I'm going to feel a little jilted here. So I ended up kind of rolling some of the, the day zero information over to to kind of further the, the discussion and, and help really get down to the nitty gritty of what they're trying to accomplish and show how how their goals kind of changed from day to day or how they realized or failed to realize those goals as it was in some cases. And there's a good variety of different projects there as well. Right, right. You also did an interview with John Harris, famous for his at play columns and obviously been on the show here a few times as well. John is one of the most knowledgeable people of the entire roguelike community. Perhaps after writing this book, you can now rival him, David. <laughs> no. uh, How did you find interviewing him? I, I really enjoyed that. Talking to, to John and, and guys like yourself is very humbling. Uh, I've never professed, I still won't profess to be an expert in, in roguelikes. I mean, even when you look at dungeon hacks, I think I cover a lot of ground, but in in the context of how many years this genre has been around and how many people are plugging away at their games, uh, my knowledge base is still pretty small. And so that's why that's why I talked to John. I thought it would be really informative for readers to to bring in as many experts as possible, especially one like John, who has really dissected roguelikes to a degree that not many other people have, and to just hear him talk about, for example, why he still believes Rogue is maybe one of the best examples of the genre, how that game still holds up, because... Toy and Wickman and Arnold set out to do something specific and they accomplished that goal rather than letting it kind of grow and then see feature creep, you know, extra features that really weren't nailed down all the way uh, set in. So it was really, really interesting talking to John. It was interesting to hear you say that and certainly I agree with you, Rogue, scope-wise, is one of the better roguelikes. But 
one of the things that you revealed in your interviews with people is that a lot of the original creators actually wanted something bigger and so I think some of them said that Moria was like their ideal this is mm-hmm. you know this is what I wanted Rogue to be kind of thing and so when they were making new versions of Rogue they were always adding new things in so I wonder if if they had kept doing that would have it would it have just ended up like NetHack anyway yeah, you do have to wonder. I mean, on the one hand, I think NetHack is a very interesting game because it is just this, it's like a giant sticky Katamari ball uh, and everything <laughs> and the kitchen sink of of elements. And some people love that. A lot of other people want a very uh, focused and streamlined theme. And I think that they can get that from, you know, Angband and Moria especially. And, and just to be clear, uh, I hope I didn't misquote them, but the opinion about Rogue came from from John. He spoke very eloquently about it, and that's, of course, in the interview in the back of the book. As for my favorite roguelike, I would probably say Moria, just because Fellowship of the Ring has always been my favorite uh, book in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and getting to explore that place and expand on it was, was a lot of fun. Have you played Sil? I have not. Have you read Silmarillion? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I've uh, The Encyclopedia. Yes, uh, I'm about halfway through it. I kind of pick apart sections here and there. If you're a fan of Silmarillion, which maybe you're not if you haven't read it all, but um, yeah, Sil is the most wonderful game. Isn't the um, objective in Sil to sort of wrest a Silmarill out of, more, out of Morgoth's crown, I think, and then yeah. sort of escape the dungeon with that? Yes, that's right. Yeah. You you want to get one of the three Silmarill from the crown of Morgoth without him killing you, and then get the hell out. Always useful. Yes, um, which uh, you know, th- it's similar to the Angband story of go down and, and kill Morgoth in the yeah. uh, in the Angband story, but Sil sticks much much closer to Tolkien mythos in all sorts of ways, and the, mm-hmm. the sort of enemies that you encounter, but also the the magic system is based on songs that you sing, and it's not firebolts and things. It's it's re- it's giving you greater light radius and giving you kind of all these different other effects, and um, it feels like a real Tolkien game unlike unlike any other Tolkien based game I've ever played because it it has the proper atmosphere and particularly tying in with the Silmarillion which isn't about messy sword fights and hordes of orcs it's it's about kind of heroes with auras of light around them and things like that and sort of grand conflicts and bravery in the face of peril and that sort of thing and yeah still captures that really really nicely well, it sounds interesting I will have to check that out mm. So now that you've written um, a book about sort of 1980s and 1995 in roguelikes, with a touch of 2013 thrown in, any temptation to write about kind of the bringing up to the modern day and uh, the roguelike likes and such? I am thinking of a sequel in that vein. I mean, obviously, you know, for example, uh, Dwarf Fortress is something that a lot of people would like to know more about. There's also Dungeon Crawl, Stone Soup. Uh, as I explain in uh, a foreword, an author's note, whatever I called it, it just wasn't possible to write about every game. But I think I would like to go forward. A lot of the stories that I wrote for this book that were going to be chapters uh, have actually been spun off because they just kind of took on a, a life of their own. For example, uh, right now I run a webzine called Episodic Content, which is on Patreon. I publish one chapter a month as well as bonus materials connected to the chapter. And the, the ongoing story is Anything But Sports, The Making of FTL. And that's a very you know, obvious example of a, a popular roguelike-like that was going to be a chapter in Dungeon Hacks, but grew into this, like, 25 30 page beast that just kind of made uh, it made more sense to to publish it the first is a serial story and then it's maybe like a standalone kindle single later on but i i think i would go back if given the chance i'm not quite sure what the focus would be because with dungeon hacks the focus the thesis was very clear choose formative roguelikes and show how they were created and and the similarities and the environments of the people who made them but roguelike likes there are so many Um, I would have to think uh, long and hard about narrowing them down. And and again, I've already written about some of them pretty extensively, such as, you know, Diablo and uh, FTL as well. I think there's an interesting, I guess called the Roguelike Renaissance story, which started with the likes of Powder and Doom the Roguelike and ended up with DCSS and Brogue. And the kind of moving away from NetHack, getting over the shadow of NetHack and finding a new direction for the genre to move in instead of simply trying to be what the games were before but bigger it's led to the seven day rls as well but it's also led to lots of other small experimental games hoplite and the like which really sort of core down the roguelike mechanics to something much smaller and much tighter as well as then with this spinning off of roguelike mechanics then into other genres entirely 
No, I absolutely agree. In fact, uh, I conducted an interview with the author of Doom RL and Diablo RL, and I, I didn't put it in the book, first of all, because the interview wasn't uh, ready in time, but also because I didn't really think it it fit the theme, and so that will be published as a chapter that will only be online. Hopefully that will act as a gateway for people who maybe haven't heard of Dungeon Hacks, and they read that, and they're like, this guy is the greatest writer of all time. I'm going to go buy his book. So <laughs> maybe that will happen. We'll see. That is always the dream. Yeah. Right, right. Let's see if I can make it come true. I don't know. Um, you you said before that you learned coding yourself, C++, Pascal, BASIC. Any temptation to write your own roguelike? I think that's something I would like to do. If not next year, then maybe the year after. And I really am looking that far ahead because I've, I've found myself in a situation where I have two manuscripts due to two different publishers by December, and they don't know it yet, but I might need to ask for an extension. So I might be neck deep in in manuscripts uh, next March. But I think that's something I, I would like to do. I would probably fall into the category of, hey guys, I made a very traditional dungeon hack. Uh, it doesn't really do anything new, but I did it. Uh, because I think that would be a milestone for me, just to to try to contribute to this genre, even if it's not something new, but just to be able to say... I made one of those. Yeah, I think it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it is definitely fun to make, and it feels really good afterwards. I mean, I'm sure you know the, the feeling of writing your first book and getting that published and kind of how, how good that felt. Yes. And, um, yeah, writing your own game is a similar kind of really nice feeling of accomplishment, uh, especially in a genre that you enjoy, like roguelikes. And also coupled with that sort of vague existential terror of, but now it's in the public domain and people will read it and comment on it and what will they say? And, oh god, I've made it open source and people are going to read my code and think I'm just, just should die. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you allowed to code like this? It should be banned. That's that, what I Dark God tells me all the time when I use the T-Engine. <laughs> I, I had those same feelings of that same feeling of trepidation walking to this interview i was saying to myself now it's not like they're going to open with this is david l craddock and his book is awful david what were you thinking but you just you never know how people are going to accept anything you put out there so well i was tempted to but mm. i decided not to in the end <laughs> well i'm glad it didn't come up mark thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> good thing no one mentioned that right well i think that's about it for the episode any any final thoughts mark or david is there any kind of big takeaway you want people to have from your book about the history of roguelikes and, and what has come before? Absolutely. You know, I know that, that sometimes, for I think for a lot of people, roguelikes can be a very intimidating genre. I mean, on the surface, you look at them and you just see a bunch of text. And for a lot of people, the reaction is, oh, that looks ugly. It's, it's more of a, that looks very complicated. To me, it's like sitting down to play a flight sim. You know, they can make those things look as realistic as possible, and I still need three keyboards to play it. But what I've really tried to do here with Dungeon Hacks is to just tell a story. Really, in a lot of ways, this, this book is not the story of how a particular genre crystallized, but the story of how people in different places who, in many cases, had never met and have still never met, were inspired by the same sorts of ideas and harbored the same sort of passion to create something. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an American dream story in, in that I think we all like to learn about people who, who set out to build something, any sort of something, and were able to make it come true. So I think there's, I think that if you, if you, if you are interested in roguelikes, if you know as much about them as, as a John Harris or of any of you folks who are regulars on the podcast, then you'll still find something to like. But if you're coming to this blind and, and you still want a good story, I think you'll find that too. I'm very proud of it. Uh, and I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. That means a lot. And I'm also, I have to say, I'm honored to be a guest on the podcast. This is a pretty big deal for me. So thank you again for having me. Thank you for coming on. Uh, so that's David Craddock. His book is named Dungeon Hacks. It's available in both audiobook and ebook. We'll include the links below. It's not awful. And it does have a lot of very <laughs> interesting stories and a lot of very personal stories there as well, which really bring a lot of life to the history. I, I do think it's a very good read. So uh, Darren Gray recommends. Agreed, likewise. Yes, I think I'll, I will include it on the cover. Darren Gray says, it's not awful. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's all for this week. Next week we'll be back with some more discussion of something to do with roguelikes. In the meantime, uh, if you've got any comments, please let us know. If you've got any thoughts on the book, any thoughts on what you would like to see in future roguelike-related books from David or from others, then uh, do post below and <laughs> maybe David can make it happen. But for now, that's all from us here. Good night from Roguelike Radio. Good night. Thanks a lot.
The show has collapsed. Would you like your podcasts identified?